What's up, gentlemen? This is Rising Phoenix Podcast, a podcast about how to rise up after your divorce. I'm your host, Michael Rhodes. Let's get into it. Joining me today is Amy. Uh, Amy, let's just jump right into it, and why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure thing. I'm Amy Adler. I'm a CPA, a certified fraud examiner, and a certified divorce financial analyst. And after 20 or so years in the accounting, audit, and fraud industries, I went through my second divorce and realized that there's a whole lot of information about the financials that people just don't know. And attorneys are not always equipped to share with clients. And Mm. so I decided to pivot my career and really make it my mission to help people through this process with a lot of the really tough decisions that they have to make in the divorce process. And even some of the decisions thereafter, because, you know, I'm a financial expert and now I've also been through it twice. And so I have, I have some of my own market research that I can share and experience. And, and also, I just really enjoy helping people. So this is a really great uh, field for me to be in. Yeah, awesome. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's always a good thing, I think, when, when people use their experiences uh, to try and help others. It's really, uh, it's really an awesome thing to do. Um, so let's really? dive into something that um, is obviously covered or, or, or uh, uh, affects everyone. Uh, especially post divorce, and that is a budget, and how and and what does that mean, and how do we set it, and uh, it's something I struggle with personally. So let's, but let's talk about like what are some key components of a budget? Like what are the things that when you sit down and go, okay, I need to make a budget. What what are the things that you absolutely need in order to figure that out? Yeah. So when you're talking about budget, I I call that the B word because people hate that, <laughs> that so yes. much, uh, especially people who are not financial minded. Um, the idea of creating a budget can be just really anxiety inducing in and of itself. And so, you know, I I try to make it a process that's that's as low stress as possible, but as informative as possible as well. And so I would say that um, this is intended to be able to prepare you for your life after divorce. So in this context, that's what, that's what we're looking at. So whether you're already divorced or in the process of divorce, um, it's really beneficial to do it while you're in process of divorce because you can use that information to help you build your negotiations for how you're going to split up your your marital estate. Really, that's, I mean, that's a big part of my process with clients anyway, because when we know what your liquidity needs are, you know, if your income doesn't, doesn't quite match up with your expenses, then, and you need more money, then you need to figure out how you can get some liquid assets out of your estate to be able to help pay your bills. But that's, that's usually not a desirable thing, no matter where you are in your, in, in life, unless you're already retired. So you really want to try to build a budget that's going to keep you in the black and not be losing money every month. So there are some really basic main components to your budget that you need to plan out first that are kind of mandatory. Everybody has to deal with these kinds of expenses and they're big. They're the biggest ones. So those things are um, your taxes. Mm. Um, you know, everyone says that, or what is, the, what's the quote? Um, two things in life are certain death and taxes. Um, <laughs> Very true. It's true. Although it's becoming more the divorce and taxes are, mm. are becoming the inevitable, unfortunately. So taxes are one of the things that you've got to always make sure that you keep in your budget and keep plan for because it's one of those things that's automatically going to be required unless you make under a certain amount of money. So, and, and that, that amount's very low. So that's, that's a big one. And that one is pretty easy to estimate. Then there's also things like your housing costs. If you own your property and you've got, a, a, you know, that's a big asset that's not very liquid. So you need to make sure that you've, made a decision about whether or not you can own a home based on whether or not you've got that liquidity available to you to pay on a mortgage or if you've got the money to just pay for the house outright. Yeah. And let's talk about that a little bit uh, because that's kind of the stuff I'm interested in is is sort of the nuance. And I know it's up to everybody and and all that kind of stuff, but what what do they say uh, uh, is a, a good percentage of of your income should go to housing like what is that so so guys are trying to figure out can i afford this what's a good baseline so that's a really hard question to answer because it depends on where you are um sure. if you're in, if you're in california people spend 50 to 75 percent of their income on their housing because they just don't have another choice 
Um, in other parts of the country, it could be you know, 20 to 30%. So I would say you, don't, you definitely don't want to spend more than half of your income on your housing if you can, yeah. that, and that's even really high. Yeah. When you're getting a mortgage, they're looking at your debt to income ratio already. They're wanting to know, you know how, how much debt do you have, and, and they're looking at how much mortgage can you afford based on them assuming how, what percentage of your income they're willing to let you spend on a, on a mortgage too. So they, they tend to max out in the 40 to 50% range, depending on how risk averse they are and how the economy is going and stuff like that. Gotcha. So, but yeah, unfortunately there's, there's no clear answer to that yeah. question because of the location and, and uh, the differences in housing costs. Yeah. But, but 40 to 50 is a, a decent target for you then, or for anyone. I would say that's on the high end. If you okay. can keep it more to 20 to 30, that would be more ideal because the other expenses can really catch up. Yeah. Quickly. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about some of those others. And, uh, you know, again, different for everybody, but what are some of the main ones that maybe people need to obviously consider and or sometimes overlook those kinds of things? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, tax is probably one of the biggest ones yep. that people forget about. Yeah. Uh, guilty. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it comes back to bite people in the rear and after the fact sometimes. So that's an, an important one to consider. And when you're building a budget, if you can start with your with your gross income, like your base basic salary and, and you know, if you're commission based, all of those kinds of things, estimate that and then include the taxes in your deductions and expenses, then you'll you'll have a, a better idea of where all the money is going. Gotcha. So that's one. Um, food is another of the really large costs. And, and this one is really funky because yeah. when you get divorced, your food costs don't cut in half. Typically that's, that's not how it works. And, uh, there are, there are so many places nowadays, especially that, that can really get you with, with the cost of food. And I'm not just talking about eating out, although that's certainly a big component of it. And, when you're setting a budget, you have to really think through, okay, how many times can I really commit to eating out in a week? You know, whether it's lunch, dinner, breakfast, whatever, it doesn't matter. How many times can I really do that? And how, and then what am I going to spend on the other meals? And how can I avoid having so much waste in my refrigerator? Because I will be the first person to admit that I go to the grocery store, bright eyed and bushy tailed, all excited about all of that fresh vegetables that I'm going to buy and I'm going to eat healthy and I'm going to do great. And then morning time comes around and I'm like, ah, I don't really feel like cooking this today. I think I'm going to stop and pick up breakfast tacos. And then when that, when that happens, <laughs> everything goes to waste, right? Or the kids wake up and they're like, I want donuts, mommy, you know? And, right. you know, so um, when you're, when you're budgeting, you have to be realistic, but you also need to think about, can you make some adjustments to your life? And that's one of the easiest areas to make some adjustments to if you just do a little bit more planning and, and maybe stick with your plan. You can really cut out a lot of expense in the food area um, if, if, if the budget is looking tight. Yeah. So, um, so again, I, 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 I think, it, you know, as best we can, well, what do they, whoever they are, what do they say is a good percentage uh, for, for groceries, eating out? All that, I, I don't know if you can lump it together, but if you can, what do they, what do they recommend? I mean, again, that one, the percentage is really hard to set because if you have a, if you have four kids, then it's going to be different than if it's just you. So there's, there's a lot of variability. I, I kind of look at budgets like snowflakes. There's just, there's just no way to really come up with an, a percentage number that feels good to, to suggest to everyone. Gotcha. Um, you know, and, and if people make more money too, then they can afford to, sure, to, sure spend more, but they may not want to. They may still want to be very green and take care of the earth and not have so much waste and, right. you know, um, and support local business, you know. So there's there's all kinds of desires and, and methodologies to go about this. But I will say that when budgets are tight, there are easy ways to, to cut the cost of food. And that's one of the places that I usually make the first recommendation to people about how to cut and how to um, live more lean because there are just so many options available to you nowadays with 
places like Butcher Box that will send really clean meats to you on a monthly basis and Costco, you know, you can go get food in bulk and mm-hmm. if you can spend more in one shopping trip, then A, you save gas money, you don't have to go to the grocery stores often and B, you also save on food costs because buying five pounds of chicken at Costco is way less than buying five individual pounds at a, at a local grocery store. Uh, so, and it makes a difference, you know, when you, when, when you go to the grocery store and you think, oh, you know, that costs like just a couple dollars more, it's no big deal. But then when you do that with how many different things and every week out of a year, there's 52 weeks in a year, then the, the money really adds up and it can actually be thousands of dollars difference in, in food spending over the course of a year. If, um, if you switch from fresh vegetables to frozen vegetables, even sometimes, you know, that can reduce your waste and reduce the cost by a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I guess with, with this, uh, with, with a lot of things in life, uh, there are just a lot of variables. Yes, exactly. So I wish I could give you a good percentage, but that one, I just, I just, can't right. in, in good, right. good conscience, give you a number there. That's okay. Uh, so, and so what are some of the, so we covered food and taxes and, uh, and housing. What are some of the other ones that, that people tend to maybe perhaps overlook? Health insurance. Mm. That's probably another of the really large expenses, especially for people who are self-employed or who aren't employed outside the home. Health insurance, even with the healthcare.gov marketplace, um, subsidies and things yeah. can get to be incredibly expensive for people. And they don't anticipate this, that suddenly they're coming off of their ex-spouse's employer's insurance and they're on their own for health insurance. And um, it can cost thousands of dollars if they use COBRA, especially because COBRA is probably the most expensive option for most people because it's 100% of what the employer would pay for for the cost there's there's no subsidization of all at all so uh there are plenty of good options out there though that are not on the healthcare.gov marketplace and really the healthcare world is changing very much right now that there are non-insurance insurance options that help people keep the cost of medical care down way lower than what health insurance companies pay for anyway. So I would highly recommend that people look into some of those more alternative style healthcare coverage options like the direct primary care models. There are doctors out there who are membership based and they'll charge $40 a month for you to be a member and you get unlimited access to the doctor. They get cheaper lab costs, they get, you know, cheaper drug costs in many cases too. And it's, it's, not, it's not a full coverage option because they don't have specialists in their office and they don't have emergency care and that kind of thing. But you can get like a supplemental plan that covers just those things in case you need them. Uh, and, and it can keep the cost down by several hundred to thousands of dollars a month, depending on how much you pay for your your PPO plan on, on a, the healthcare.gov marketplace. So that's another really big one that people oftentimes don't think about, especially when they're in the divorce process and don't know what their options are, what their, their insurance situation is going to even look like afterwards. So that's another big one that I always tell people to think a lot about. Um, those are really the biggest items that tend to come up most often for people. Um, other than savings and retirement, right? You know, the, that's that's a uh, it's a big issue for a lot of people, especially for coming out of divorce pretty soon after divorce. And I would say that what I have to tell people most of the time is to give yourself some grace because if you're paying child support or if you're paying alimony and you're not able to put money away into your four hundred one k for a couple of years because you're trying to get on your feet after separating and dealing with all this stuff, it's okay. Yeah. It, it sucks, right? There's no doubt about it, that especially when you're still young and you, should, and you could be contributing a lot to your retirement plan that's gonna grow over the next 20, 30 years. Yes, absolutely, it sucks, but 
it's okay. It's not going to, it's not the end of the world. Like there are still plenty of people who are still able to retire at normal retirement age who have gotten divorced in their thirties and forties and, and have made it work. So I, I do try to advise people that if it's possible at the very least, try to put away up to whatever you, the employer's match yeah. maximum is if you can, because yeah. obviously that's money that's thrown away. Um, if you can't put yeah, that's it away. A, that's a tough one for, for me. Um, <clears throat> a tough topic, um, uh, just because of, you know, it's, and I don't think this is a, a, a bias against men. It's, I think it's the higher earners, but you know, for a long time, I can remember saying to her, like, you, you know, have you started your 401k? Have you, and you know, it, it, she didn't. And, and then, but then she did, but I mean, she, she was, she lagged behind. And so my 401k was up here and hers is down here. Well, who loses in that scenario? It's me because I did the right thing and I put stuff away. I have to give a large, large chunk uh, throughout this process, um, I, I, I will have, when it's all said and done, uh, I will have lost uh, over half of my retirement. So it's, um, it, you know, I can say a lot of things about it. And, and I think I'm more at the acceptance part of it because, I mean, I can't do anything anyway, right? I can get angry about it and be pissed off, but I mean, it does mean zero. There? Yeah. Th oh, I'm sorry. Did you lose me? Yes. I'm sorry. I lost you for a minute there. That's okay um you said throughout the process yeah so uh so th this this I'll, I'll just back up to to this is this has been a this has been a this is a tough topic for me because i i've lost um i'd say probably well not probably when it's all said and done oh, i've lost half of my retirement um <sighs> yeah which is not 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 good it's not fun uh but you know i'm more i'm more at the acceptance part of it than than uh than the anger. Uh, I mean, but I can't do anything about it anyway, you know, mm -hmm. um, but her, her inaction uh, with putting stuff away and, and just because I made more period. <clears throat> um, so I, I put more away. And so there's a, there's a, it's out of balance. And so I lose in that scenario and it sucks. Um, uh, sorry. I think there should be something done about that. Uh, that's a whole separate conversation. Uh, but um it, you know, I don't understand why I'm being punished for making more uh, and thus putting away more. But um, unfortunately, my hands are tied, so I can't do anything about it. Um, but let's talk about so that, that kind of covers the, the budget in terms of some of the major things that, that we should account for. But how about do's and don'ts? Like what's some things that we should do, um, maybe even while setting the setting the budget or while um, living and, and going through uh, and, and living our budget, so to speak? What are some of those things you should and shouldn't do? So the first shouldn't do is, is try not to stress over it too much. I mean, I, I say that with, you know, take that with a grain of salt, because I know that money is just a stressful topic for a lot of people. And the whole concept of looking at it on a regular basis just aggravates the anxiety around it. So totally understand that. Um, and so what I recommend to people is, you know, don't make it something that you're obsessing over and looking at on a daily basis or even a monthly basis. I think that um, the best way to really budget is to look at, you know, maybe a year's worth of, of expenses from the last year. A year is good because it gets you, gets you through all the seasons and the cycle. It's, um, you, you could do six months, but sometimes, especially depending on where you live, the, your even your utility costs can change very significantly from one season to the next. I know here in Texas, like our summer electric bills are are several hundred dollars a month more than they are in the winter. So it's, yeah. um, it makes a really big difference in the in a in a budget. So a year's worth would be ideal if you can. And you know, exporting your credit card statements and your bank statements into some some type of spreadsheet format that can pivot and, and, and summarize the data for you is great. Or use, use a, an app that, that has the ability to do it for you if you're not familiar with Excel. Um, do it once for that year, use that to create your budget and maybe look at it once a quarter to see how you're doing against it. And, and then you can make adjustments there. If you see that you've spent more on food than you had budgeted for per month, over the course of the quarter, then on average, 
maybe you need to look at, well, okay, I actually spent more this month because it, it happened to be that it was my kiddo's birthday. And so food costs were a little more because we had a party, you know, right. or if it's actually that, well, okay, so I got lazy and I decided to eat out a few more times and that's why it cost a little bit more Then you kind of look at yourself and think, is it realistic for, for me to, to, do I have the, the physical energy to be able to cook those few more meals or to plan ahead for those few more meals? And, and, you know, if you don't, then maybe you need to look at some of the other items on your budget and see if there's something else you could give up. You know, maybe, you know, for women, maybe you, you get your hair done every three months instead of every two months, you know, or something to try to, to try to compensate for that additional cost. Um, gotcha. You know, like I said, don't be too hard on yourself. That's that's really the, the biggest point that I can make because it's really easy to to get upset when you see your mm. your spending according to your budget and that you were off on every single item. You know, this is it's a new process and, and you're gonna live and you're gonna learn and you don't know what you don't know until yeah. you're actually in the situation. And so especially if you have a little bit of money in savings to be able to compensate for if you've overspent your budget a little bit. I always recommend to people to try to do that, you know, at least have a few thousand dollars in savings, mm. in cash savings that's easily accessible to be able to pull in, in case of emergency, you know, the shit happens fund yeah. or, <laughs> um, or just if you happen to overspend your budget and are still trying to figure it out because yeah. it's new and you're learning what your life, what you want your life to look like too. You know, one of the things that I always tell people about in the budgeting process, especially in a divorce is you get to, you get to write your own future. Now you get to decide what your life is going to look like. Do you want to travel more? Do you want to join clubs? Do you want to take classes and go back to school? You know, what do you want to do with your life right now? It's an opportunity, really. And looking at preparing a budget in that way can really help to shift your mindset to make it a more positive experience too, that I think is really helpful. Yeah. And so building your budget, start off with making it what you want, what you, if you could build your ideal life, this is what my budget would look like, you know, and of course you've got to be somewhat reasonable because once you look at your income and what your ability, what your ability to pay for that life is, then you're going to have to back off on some of the things that you may not be able to afford to do right now. Yeah. But at least if you're starting with what your goal is, then you have something to work towards and something to look forward to as well. And also gives you to make more money, find more ways to, to earn, you know, there's passive income sources. There's all kinds of things, especially with technology these days, there's all kinds of ways that people can make money. Uh, in a in a legal way <laughs> that may not involve your job, your your full time job. So yeah. um, it it can be a good motivator there too. Yeah. But I think those are a couple of important big picture do's and don'ts. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the specifics, I would say just be as reasonable as possible when you're coming out with your final budget, you know, think through what you realistically are willing to make yourself do yeah. to live by this and how important is it to you to, to live by it? Yeah. Well, and, and, and I, I agree. I mean, it's, I think it's a, it's a lot of, I forget who, who, uh, whose quote it is, but life is about decisions and, mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately you're, you're faced with some, uh, I think it might be Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, who I love. Um, it, it is really, it comes down to, you know, what is important? What, what, what do you want to do? What can you do? I mean, it's about deciding um, sort of maybe what your priorities are, uh, what you're trying to accomplish, those, those kinds of things are questions that probably need to be answered around this topic because it'll inform you on some of the things you want to do. I mean, if you want to retire early, obviously, then you got to make decisions that would allow that. Or if you mm -hmm. want, like, I fuck it, I want to eat out four, four times a week. All right, well, then you make decisions based around that. Um, so, but, uh, and let's, let's jump into um, softwares or ways to budget. Like, what do you recommend? Is it just Excel or their programs? What, what are you uh, typically tell people to do? 
So there are some really great apps and, and other programs out there that are connected to the banks and such that are really helpful, especially for people who don't feel comfortable with Excel. I actually really like using Excel because I can make it super simple. Mm. And I think that it can be a really overwhelming experience for people. If you, you know, Mint is great. Um, it's the Intuit product that um, is really useful and helpful and actually can translate right over to TurboTax if you want to use it for taxes. Um, and Simplify is Quicken's um, like mobile app option if you want to use your phone to be able to keep track of everything rather than be on a computer all the time. Mm. I know I like, especially on the weekends and things when I, when I want to do personal stuff, I don't want to look at my computer because I do that all week long. So uh, using my phone makes it much more accessible and I'm much more willing to do it when I can just sit there and do, and play on it while I'm watching TV or doing something else. Yeah. More entertaining. Yeah. So, um, so those are a couple of good ones and Fidelity, like some of the big banks, like Fidelity has full view, which can pull in all of your other bank information so that you can see your full asset, um, your net worth, and it, and it will calculate all of that for you and, and includes your investments. Um, so it's really helpful because then it will give you recommendations for how much money to try to save in order to meet your future retirement plans or whatever, whatever savings goals you have. So those are great, but I, I, I really do like using Excel because I like to keep it simple, as simple as possible for people, especially in the divorce process, when there's already so many things in your brain and so many stressors in your, on your, let's just break down to a few simple categories of expenses and let's figure out, you know, how much money do you bring in? How much money do you spend? Where can we cut costs if you need to, to make ends meet, you know? And, and also, you know, we use that to negotiate how much child support is appropriate or spousal maintenance or whatever, you know, here's, here's what my budget looks like and here's how much I can afford to pay right. if anything, or here's, or here's how much I need if you're the receiving um, ex-spouse. So having that in a simplified manner is, is easier to share. Now that said, the legal documents can be incredibly voluminous too. So if you're if you have to fill out a budget on one of the legal forms, there's a lot of detail to it and Excel really helps to be able to populate that in the way like I have a template that I use to fill in the uh, the Texas forms since mm -hmm. most of my most of my clients are in Texas where I'm located. Um, I've, I've already developed a template that I can just use to fill out with them quickly that then will populate the, the legal form for them in the negotiation process. Um, and so I think it's just really user-friendly and also yeah. something that's just manageable to use Excel. And you can pivot when you, when you get your statements, you can use pivot tables if you know how to do those to, mm. to classify, categorize the expenses and the total dollars over whatever period of time you want to look at. You can just slice it and dice it a lot of different ways to, to figure out where your spending is and, and right. where maybe you can cut things if you need to. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I use it a good bit uh, with, with work stuff. So it, it definitely mm -hmm. is a very handy tool. Um, well, I, I want to thank you. I think there, there's so much uh, to this topic. There's, I mean, and there's a lot of nuance too. And, and I think, uh, like you said, it, it is really uh, comes down to the individual and, and what they're uh, presented with and, and child support and alimony and, and their income and uh, cost of living. And there's a, there's a billion different things it feels like. So um, I, I agree that it, it it can't be cookie cutter in some ways. So um, I, I appreciate that insight and I, and I appreciate you uh, for doing this. And uh, I want to wrap it up. The last question that I ask everybody is, uh, is the words of wisdom, uh, what or advice that you would give to a man that is just starting this process. Maybe he just got served. Maybe he just got told, um, you know, I'm done, I'm moving out or you need to move out, whatever the scenario, what are some words of wisdom you would impart to that man? Oof. Well, so having, having been through divorce twice uh, and both times to men, <laughs> <laughs> I can say that um, 
I can appreciate the stress level of, of, of the whole situation. And I think that the important thing to remember is, is much like the things that I say to people who are pregnant and who are worried about childbirth is that millions of people have done it before you and are probably going to do it after you and have all survived and thrived, most of whom have thrived. And you, you will do the same. You just have to make sure that you've got a team of people who are supporting you. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It is not like asking for directions. You need the support and you need the help to get there because you are not expected to be an expert at everything in life. And this is one of the areas that hopefully you will never have to experience again. Yeah. And so just reach out for the folks who, who know what they're doing for help because it, it makes it can make thousands of dollars of difference and can really be super comforting and, and helpful to just ease your mind. Yeah, no, agreed. Uh, I, I think uh, that that's one of the challenges I think um, for, for me, uh, for, for men is to, to put their hand up and say, I need some help. And, mm -hmm. and, and there are so many facets of divorce. Um, there are obviously there's the emotional and, and the financial and, and, uh, you know, the impact on children, should you have any? And, uh, there's just, it's, there's so many different, um, components of it. And, and I think it's important that those areas where we just, we don't feel like we, we know what the heck we're doing. We just, we just got to reach out and ask for help. It's, it's, it's simple as that. And, and, and maybe it's, it's not financial, maybe it's mental maybe it's and, not. and you, you need to, 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 talk to psychiatrist or whatever, but whatever it is that you, you feel like you need help with, just go get it. It's, it's, it, it's makes a huge difference for sure. I agree. Yeah. Well, Amy, I want to thank you. This was awesome. I appreciate your, your info and insight and uh, how can people find you? What's the best way to get a hold of Amy Adler? Your divorce asset.com is my website. I also can be followed at that same handle on Instagram. I've got a Facebook Adler divorce financial Facebook page, LinkedIn, um, or email me at amy at yourdivorceasset.com. I'm happy to help however I can. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Thank you to Nick Coyle and Lifer for allowing me to use their song, Born Again, which you're hearing now and at the intro to the podcast. Thank you to Justin Dillahanty and all of my brothers at The Alpha Code. Please visit the website, risingphoenixpodcast.com, to connect with me and other like-minded men who are looking to thrive and grow after their divorce. And remember to surround yourself with people who add value to your life, who challenge you to be greater than you were yesterday, who sprinkle magic into your existence like you do to theirs. Life is not to be done alone. Find your trust.